We are continuing with our series on exploring the soul. Last week, we dedicated much of the class about the sphera of dot. Just as a review, <clears throat> we have been concentrating on what are called the powers of the soul and their garments. We reviewed the garments a few weeks ago of thought, speech, and action. And since then, we've been concentrating on the powers of the soul. And very simply, the powers of the soul are the spherot, especially the inner psychological dimension of the spherot. And therefore, a power of the soul is chesed. A power of the soul is gevura, is to ferret. And of course, the inner dimensions of love and awe and fear and compassion. So we've gone over this many times, but just as a review, the powers of the soul are the spirit. And of course, when we went to the 49 days of counting the Omer, we really concentrated, we, we really tried to use the spirit as what's called tikkun amidot. The seven lower spirit is to fix our meet out our, our character, our personality traits. And so we got to dot because dot is considered the, we'll call it the headquarters of, of consciousness. And we learned that dot is a connector. It connects the superconscious levels of Keter with the lower normative powers of the intellect and the emotions and the instinctual nature of a human being. And that's its role. Dot is a connector. Its inner dimension is called Yichud, is unification. And from that, there's a lot of symbolism with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And where we took it to last week, and this is where we're gonna to continue today, that this idea of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, what it represents in the deepest uh, level is the soul's power to choose. When we're told that we're create, a human being is created in the image of God, there is no other creation that has that category. Everything has a spark of God. As we've learned on a deep level, everything has a part of consciousness because of that spark of God. Anything living, whether it's plant, animal, or human, is going to have a level of consciousness. And as we've explored, in a certain level, a level of soul. And we've even learned that the idea of the inanimate mineral world also on some uh, level, and as we mentioned, science is somewhat baffled by the apparent consciousness that even a singular atom has or a singular electron has. This is cutting edge quantum physics right now. And perhaps in the future we'll get more of a scientific description of this, but in Kabbalah and the Arizal spoke about these things already. So the idea, the question is, what does it mean in the image and likeness of God? So there are many, many possible answers, many possible answers. One is the fact that we have a soul and our soul, Nishmat Chayim, is different than any other soul or consciousness, but on a deeper level, the, the, in a sense, the ultimate of being in the image of God is having free will. Later in the class, we're going to get into the, what is referred to as the paradox of paradoxes, how divine providence and omniscience works simultaneously with free will. This in all the writings is called the paradox of paradoxes. 
how these two things are both true, and yet there's an element that seems to be uh, mutually exclusive between God's omniscience, especially of, of, of the future, and how that impacts on our ability to choose. That we'll get to. But to just go back a step, dot is considered the place of choice. So I just want to read what we're going to do tonight. We're going to take, God willing, uh, what's called the partsuf. We're going to take the full persona of dot, meaning just like we do sphera to Omer, chesed sheba chesed, gevura sheba chesed, tefera sheba chesed. We're going to do that with dot, and we're going to see how all of the spherot operate within dot, but all in one context, how we make choices, how we take consciousness and employ consciousness in order to make choices. So I just want to read uh, one paragraph from Ralph Ginsburg's book that we have been using uh, right here called Consciousness and Choice. Here it's called Finding Your Soulmate. The first half of the book, he dis discusses how dot is the, we'll call it the headquarters of consciousness, and how the essence of consciousness is, is wrapped up with choice and free will. So this is what he says. He says, following the unfolding of the decision process, which is what we are going to do in a minute, we arrive at its core, the stage known as dot within dot, knowledge within knowledge, or the attachment of consciousness. Here, consciousness becomes the hinge on which our soul's connection with outer reality depends. Because in other words, without consciousness, we are not connected to outer reality. The nature of this attachment becomes the impetus for all of our tentative choices in life, choices that will ultimately be put to the test by active experience in the arena of knowledge and relationships. So with that as a, an introduction, I am going to try to share a screen with you. Oh, how did I get this green? Okay. Here we go. Oh, how did this get here? I'm not sure how to get rid of that box, but we'll deal with it. Okay, so what we're looking at is what we're ca what's called the partsuf. For those with, hopefully everyone is on our WhatsApp group. Everyone got this chart and the, the other chart that we're gonna show. And this goes through the crown of knowledge, wisdom of knowledge, understanding of knowledge, etc. In other words, all the spirit within knowledge itself. So we're going to go through this relatively quickly, relatively quickly, because it, it's like a flow chart. Let me just show you more as a, like a flow chart. And it's the same, same here, but, but instead of the structure of the sphere out, it's more like a flow chart. So we're going to start at the top at Keter, and we're going to go to the bottom relatively quickly. Rob Ginsburg uh, takes like 50, 60 pages to explain this. So we start in deepening, 
what's called deepening of knowledge. And what this is, is that I mentioned before, are we a soul in a body or a body that happens to have a soul? In other words, where is the emphasis? So this idea of deepening of consciousness has to do with the awareness that ultimately what we are is a soul that is housed in a body. The soul is the, the, the main thing. This is not in any way to put down the body. Obviously, there has to be a unity between spiritual and physical, mind and body, soul and body. But deepening is an important step where we realize what the source of who we are and what we're doing in the world is in our connection to God. So here, this is at a super conscious level where we try to deepen our connection with our true soul roots. When we go to wisdom of knowledge, expansion, so if, if our consciousness remained in the level of superconscious, we obviously would have a very, very difficult time of operating in this world whatsoever. Because our, as it were, our, our heads would be in the clouds and we would have no real uh, deep connection with the physical world that we live in. And of course, there are people who have very difficult time operating in this world because sometimes the, the mind is just on, on, up in the clouds. We use that expression. So the expansion of knowledge. So this is like a bridge of, of the first step of pulling super consciousness into normative consciousness of pulling what we'll call normative uh, wisdom from a higher source. And this expansion is what allows us to, like the, the ladder in Jacob's dream, that the ladder can be firmly grounded in the earth, but its head can reach the heavens. And that is, that is a good thing, where we can be grounded and yet very, very spiritual and uh, have our heads in the cloud at the same time. So the expansion, Brock Ginsburg explains, this in addition has to do with the openness to diversity. Because this is, the world is one, God is one, but there's no doubt that God created a world of apparent multiplicity. And so the expansion of wisdom, remember this is all within dot, all within knowledge, all within consciousness, all within soul power. So diversity is a very, very first step in expanding consciousness. And in Hebrew, there's a word for this, it's called harchavat hadat, the expansion of knowledge, harchavat hadat. And then we have stability. This is bina. As we've learned many times, the, the uh, metaphor of wisdom being like the father contributing the seed idea, the seed of inspiration to the mother figure of understanding of Bina. And the mother takes the seed and creates a, an embryo, a child, through stability. Because wisdom can be like flashes of lightning. And that needs to be more stable. So within dot and consciousness, 
there needs to be this, this stabilizing energy called Bina. And then we have knowledge of knowledge. As we said, the inner dimension of knowledge is Yichud. And so when we say about Chabad, Chabad is Chachma, Bina, and Dat. So Dat is this idea of attachment. In other words, Chachma and Bina can be um, somewhat ethereal. But Dat is the, the ability to become one with that which we are learning about or who we are connecting with. This is the ability to make uh, relationships, to be attached. That's why the first time knowledge, dot, is used as a verb in the Torah is Adam yada et chava ishto. And Adam knew his wife. And, and we're told that this means he knew her intimately, marital intimacy. And that becomes the metaphor of all knowledge is that it's not something out there, but it's something that we can integrate that becomes one with us, yichud. This kind of attachment leads to affinity. This is chesed, loving kindness. In other words, when we, become, when we have the ability to attach ourselves, it could be to a person or an idea or a talent. Like someone says, I love music. Because a person becomes attached to music and that creates an affinity to music. Or I love a certain person or I love an idea. I love the Torah. I love the land of Israel because we feel attached to it and we have this affinity. And then comes a very, very important step. Remember, this is all in the context of how we make decisions. In other words, we start, I'm just gonna go back. We start with deepening of consciousness and expansion of consciousness and the stability and the ability to make attachments will eventually all of these powers are going to hopefully be manifest in actual decisions we make for our life. In other words, we make decisions based on what we have an affinity for, what, or what repulses us, what, we, what we're able to connect to, to attach to. That it becomes the basis of how we make decisions. So here in strength of knowledge, this is gavura. This is an incredibly important one called objectivity. Because when we're dealing with love, already this is in, in the realm of the emotions. So our emotions are not always reliable. They're, they're wonderful, but they're not always reliable. So we need objectivity. And this is a very important power of the soul, is to be able to look at reality, look at factors, look at priorities, and attempt to be objective, because we're, we're born with egos, and we're egocentric by nature. So it's even explained that one of the ideas of eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil is that human beings, in a sense, lost a certain objectivity and became much more um, egocentric, sub subjective ways of looking at reality. So once we have affinity and objectivity, then we have to unite them in what's called appraisal. And this is obviously where the beginning of actual choices are happening because we have affinities, we have things that repulse us, that we push away. And then we have to appraise well, what, what's the balance between these forces. 
on the right of the sphero and the left of the sphero. So appraisal is what's called beauty, which is to ferret. And then as we begin to appraise a reality, appraise um, decision-making, appraise our situations, our, uh, our objectives in life, then we get to Netzach, where the power of the soul is resolve. Because as we begin to make decisions, we have to have resolve. So here a person has gone through this whole chart and is coming to a decision, a, a resolve to do something. And then that resolve needs to be checked again from the left side, which is called hold of concurrence. And those, everyone knows how many times, like with great enthusiasm, we take on a, 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 um, a task or an objective or a plan. And it could be an hour later, a day later, a month later, we start to lose our inspiration, we lose our resolve and sometimes we can't even remember why we started in the first place. So we need this power of concurrence in order to make sure that our decisions are really what we want. And then, in a sense, decision is made in Yesod foundation. That's where we, we ground our decision. And we begin the, the process of putting it in motion. And then in kingdom, in Malchut, we find the way to express all of these powers through thought, speech, and action, mostly action. Because a lot of this chart is dealing with thought and speech and trying to figure things out, whether it's only in one's mind or with other people, with uh, friends or professionals or with God through prayer. And then we express our decision making. So I'm just gonna show again, like as a, as a flow chart, how we, we go through. And here you'll see that there's some Hebrew words and each one of them ends with dot, with knowledge. So not all of them are known, but um, expansion is, is a very well-known phrase called harchavat hadat, expanding our consciousness, our dot. And the one for stability is also, uh, even in modern Hebrew, is called Yeshuv Hadat. Yeshuv Hadat means, Yeshuv literally means sitting. But here it means having peace of mind, having uh, a, a, a grounding to our, our thought process. And then in In expression, in modern Hebrew, this is actually used a lot, what's called chavat dat. It's actually from the word chava. Chavat dat literally means expressing knowledge. In modern Hebrew, when a, let's say a certain decision has to be made or a certain um, uh, area needs to be checked out, an area of, of, of of, of science, of art, what engineering, whatever it is, there are questions about a certain project. And so you have to do a study. And the final conclusion of any study in modern Hebrew is called Chabat Adat. This is the, the final study. This is what it's saying. This is what we should do. So, Yeah, okay. So I do want to point something out that I haven't pointed out. It's a simple but very important thing. 
When we look at the amida, the amida is broken into three sections. The, the, the standing or the silent prayer, that is the main prayer of Judaism, of every prayer service is the amida. <clears throat> and the first three are, uh, are praise. The last three are thanksgiving or acknowledgement. And the middle are requests. And there's 12, and then a, 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 another one was added at some point in, in history, a 13th request. The first request is, You have given a human being the, the ability of dat, the quality of dat. And the, and the blessing ends, Baruch atah Hashem, chonein hadat. You have graced man with dat. This is very important. This is our first request in the Amida every day that we acknowledge that this, this gift of consciousness, this gift of the ability to choose is really what makes us in the image of God? This is the, the really the ultimate that we have the ability to choose other than, as we've discussed, that animals are hardwired for pleasure, survival, and for uh, being fruitful and multiplying. And they, a, an animal makes decisions, but it's all hardwired to the most immediate, what's good for the, the, the physical pleasures. And, and we discussed how, how plants also, plants also seem to have a whole decision-making apparatus of to survive and to give forth seed for another generation. But it's only man that is making choices in the moral, ethical, philosophical, spiritual, mystical level. So the first thing we ask for every day is that we have a refined sense of consciousness. bina. <laughs> Chachma bina vidat. This is Nusach Sfard. That we're asking God that you've graced us with, with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Again, Chabad. And, and then we, we ask God to grant us. The last one, though, is dat. We don't ask for the wisdom or the, the bina because without the dat, the wisdom and the understanding, in a sense, will just will not be will not be stable it's that which stabilizes our consciousness and allows us the ability to to choose okay so now i want to in in a shortened form because this is what we're, we're about to enter into is the paradox of paradoxes, is how does free will and divine providence and omniscience work? Truthfully, we're not, we're not gonna go deep into the paradox, but we're gonna try to understand what does free will actually mean and what are its parameters? What's the context? And when we talk about that, that we have free will, what does that mean? And as mentioned before, there are many different religions or philosophies that lean very, very much to either free will, and there is no divine providence, or it's all divine providence, and there's very little free will. Judaism makes a huge effort to be right in the middle. The golden path 
and embraces both sides of the equation and, and holds that both free will is absolutely true and God's omniscience and divine providence is also absolutely true. One does not cancel out the other. The philosophy and the, and, and the, and the, the deep understanding of how that paradox works that we're not going to address tonight. But what I do want to look at is when we talk about free will, what exactly are we talking about? So first of all, we have to say that even though we, we posit that we have free will, a lot of what we call choice is not real free will. In other words, because of what's called nature and nurture, there, there is a lot of our being that has uh, somewhat predetermined factors. Our genetic code is, is what we're born with. We did not have choice over that genetic code and all of the ramifications of the tendencies that the genetic code puts on a person. But even more, whether, whether we're talking about psychology that posits that by the, by the age of two or three, most of us have very few memories of before the age of two. Somehow that's how the brain works, is as we get older, we can barely bring up a memory from the age of two, sometimes not even till three. A few memories here and there, but much of psychology says so much of our being is already stamped into our personality based on those first two, two, two years. And we have no recollection of it. So that means that many of the choices that we're making, we think we're totally total free will here, but not so, not so simple, not so simple at all. There's a, a story in the, in, in the Talmud that it says that when any um, person is about to be born, an angel comes with the like, the sperm and the egg, and says to God, is this person going to be rich or poor? Is this person going to be uh, tall or short? And a whole list of things like that. And the Gomorrah points out that the, the angel never asks, is this person going to be good or evil, righteous or the opposite? And from that, the Gemara says, Kol Everything is in the hands of God, except for Yirat Shemayim. So there's thousands of years of discussion what that means. Yirat Shemayim, everything is in God's hand, except the awe of God. Now, very paradoxically, when we're talking about free choice, that God gave a person so much free choice that a person can choose not to believe in God at all. That's as, as far as, as you can go, that God gave over this power to a human being, not even to recognize where he comes from, that there's even, there is even a divine figure or divine providence. So <clears throat> the other thing I'll, I'll mention is called mazel. Mazel, like mazel tov, mazel tov. Mazel literally means a, 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 a star. Mazel tov means the, the stars should be good for you. So, whoa. Now, if you look in the Gomorrah, there is a lot of this discussion and approval of the idea that there is a certain influence from the stars. But we cannot use that influence to determine our actions. 
That is not that is forbidden in, in Judaism. But to recognize that uh, uh, that the different planets have an influence on us is considered 100% um, acceptable. And there's much discussion in the Gomorrah about these influences. Now, all I'm trying to point out is whether it's our DNA. I didn't mention peer pressure, society pressures. So we think we're like totally free to make any decision that we want. The way that we're raised, these, the, the influences of those first couple years, all of this has an influence on our choices. So, so many times we make choices and we think that this is an objective choice, but it's not that simple. A person has to look very, very, very deeply to understand what is the motivation for my wanting to do X, Y, or Z. And, in, and if we really delve deeply, we see it's, it's because of all of these nature and nurture influences. Now, on top of that, now this might sound that I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm not all that in favor of free will. No, all I'm trying to establish here is when we say free will, we have to know the context in which we're, we're talking. Rob Ginsburg actually says that free will is so powerful, he, he called it like a mutation, that a person can have every strike against them. A person could have every factor working against them, but the power of true free will and choice can overturn almost everything. The expression is Ein devar o ratzon. nothing stands before will. So all I'm trying to point out is that there are many things stacked in a sense against us. One of the other things is Gilgul, reincarnation. So we basically believe that we're not here for the first time or second or third. We've been here before many times. And each one of us is carrying a soul history with us. And many of us are here to either fix, repair, heal, improve, expand on what we've done in the past. So here we're coming into the world with a certain soul history that is also going to be a factor in who we are and what we choose. But, uh, but this idea is Ein devar or Or the same thing with tshuva. Ein devar tshuva. Nothing stands in the way of tshuva. Like I said, a person can have every nature and nurture factor working against them and still succeed. Someone could be born with every opportunity, every to a rich family um, with lots of power and have everything they could ask for. And they could turn out to be total failures in everything that they do. And someone else could be born under dire circumstances, including uh, different physical uh, ailments or um, different uh, impediments, very serious impediments, and end up being incredibly successful. That is the power of free will. But I'm just trying to point out is that it's not as open as we think. Uh, Rambam, Maimonides, is maybe the greatest proponent of free will, but he writes in Hilcho Tshuva, uh, specifically about, about uh, Paro, Pharaoh, and because the first five 
uh, plagues, it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. But the last five, it says that God hardened his heart. So my mind is just like, well, what happened to his free will? Once God starts to harden your heart, it's, you, you don't have that free will. And so Maimonides said something very, very important. He said, we have free will, but if a person, um, if a person abuses their free will too many times, it can be taken away from you. That's where divine providence comes in. And now that we've mentioned divine providence, I'll bring just one example so we can get an idea of another factor is what's called the covenant of the pieces, Brit Benabatarim, where God comes to Abraham and he tells him what's going to happen the next four generations and how he, his children are going to go down and they're going to be oppressed. And after four generations, they're going to come up and come back to Israel. So we would ask, well, and that's exactly what happened. So we'd ask, well, where did people's free will go if, if, if on the bigger picture, our history was just determined for us? And so the way we answer it is, and that's where the paradox comes in, because we do believe that there is a plan for the world and that the world is moving in a certain direction and that God does have providence over the world and everything that is happening. Part of God's providence is that he gives us free will so in a sense for god it's a paradox also he, in a sense he he ties his whole his own hands because those are the rules that he made god once god allows free will and allows nature to run its course then man is going to do what they do. And yet there is a master plan and the world is moving towards a certain um, finish line. How those two work together, really only God knows. But the answer for the question about Abraham in those 400 years is that the overall uh, plan is in motion, but it's, it's a gray area. That's why the, the whole thing is, it said for 400 years, and yet we were, all, we were in, in Egypt only 210 years. And so everything of divine promise, the same thing with all of the prophecies of the prophets, they came and they gave very definitive um, uh, predictions of what would happen, but it was always on uh, Al Tanai, on, um, uh, how do you say Al Tanai, on, uh, what? On condition. Thank you. My wife in the background. On condition. So, if the people would change their minds, these very exact predictions wouldn't have to come true. But if the people didn't change, they did come true. That's why you see in the, in the book of Deuteronomy, you see that's why it's so paradoxical, is in the book of, uh, of Deuteronomy is the one time where God tells us that we have choice, where it says, I put before you today death and life, evil and good, and choose life. In other words, this is, this is the formula for the existential human condition. God puts before us choices, good and evil, and tells us to choose good. And he, he puts a tremendous amount of power in our hands. 
And yet in the book of Deuteronomy, after that, God comes to Moses and says, and, but now I'll tell you what's going to happen. Because God knows the future before we understand it. Before we know it, God sees everything, past, present, and future. And so here, God gives us free will. But then he comes and says, but I'll tell you what's going to happen. And exactly in the, what, what God says will happen in the book of Deuteronomy is exactly what happened. But each person's role in that bigger historical uh, flow of events is not determined. And that's why we have this example. There's a mitzvah that if you build a new house, you have to put a guardrail about around it. It says, so the fallen one will not fall off. So Rashi and every other commentator asks, what does the Torah mean? So the fallen one will not fall off. So Rashi says, and it's, it's so profound. He says, this person is, it's, it's been determined this person has to fall off a roof. But, but make sure it's not off your roof. That's why you have to build a guardrail. But this person is going to end up falling off a roof for reasons based on their whole um, life history, measure for measure. But, but you have the choice to do what you can do to make sure it's not off your roof. So all of history as it unfolds, each person still has the choice where they're going to fit into this bigger picture. And to be honest, sometimes we don't have the choice. People get, that's one of the factors. That's what I was saying in the beginning. The fact that we have free choice, but things happen to us that we don't choose, and then we have to deal with them. So we don't have what's called absolute free choice. If we had absolute free choice, and the, the world would be perfect, there would be no challenges, and <laughs> shalom al Yisrael. But we don't determine everything, but we can determine how we react to it. That will remain in our hands. So since we were talking about choice, I wanted to bring this up. We really just scratched the surface of the paradox of free will and divine providence. But ultimately, we have this idea that the sages talked about a lot, which is called being a partner with God. And being a partner with God is through the power of the soul to make moral and ethical choices. That's where we, that's really the, the bottom line here. We've been looking, we've been exploring the soul. We've looked at it from many, many, many different uh, aspects and perspectives. And ultimately, when it gets down to it, each person, all we have ultimately is the free will that God gave us. If not, we would be like, as it were, marionettes. In other words, to not believe in free will and to believe that God is running everything, which in a sense, God is. But to think that I don't really have free will, everything is determined, everything is, is fate, then it, it would be like God is running the world and we're all marionettes. And when I think of the world like that, I can't for the life of me understand why God would create a world like that whatsoever. But the, the idea of, of God making us a partner and creating us in the image of God and breathing a nishmat chayim, a living soul and consciousness, including divine consciousness, 
And as Pirkei Avot says, that we could rise to the level to make his will your will. That's, in a sense, the ultimate free will is to make his will your will, which in a sense sounds contradictory and paradoxical in of itself. But when we can merge God's will and our will, then in a sense, we, we solve the paradox of free will and determinism, free will and omniscience and divine providence. So this is a good place to, to stop. And to be honest, I haven't decided, but this, this might be the conclusion of our series on exploring the soul. We just scratched the surface. We could, there's, there's so much deeper that we can go. In the next week, I'm going to decide if there's another element or two that I want to add here, or it's time to move on to something new. But I hope everyone um, got a lot out of exploring the soul. For those of you who missed some of the classes, and if, if you're on the um, on our WhatsApp, you can go back and listen to the whole series. And um, we should all be blessed to use our, our free will, our free choice to ubacharta to choose life.